we're bi building out of Acts 2, 42. And Acts 2, 42 says, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Uh, this is a pattern that we will understand as it relates to gathering from house to house. This is going to be something we're going to really get into. We started this at the beginning of the week and we're going to continue it on until we get through it. I believe in order to function in the Lord's ecclesia, we must position ourselves uh, for availability. And we position ourselves by uh, following our patterns and principles that we see in the word of God. Uh, now, when Jesus left and ascended back into heaven, he did not leave a list of how-tos to the believers. He didn't say, you know, you do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Uh, they had basic instructions. That was they had to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. That's what they had to do primarily. And of course, we all know the powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Uh, but even then, there was no day-to-day -day, uh, activities manual uh, for them to follow. It just was not there. Uh, praise God. And always, I always thank all of you who post these scriptures online because that helps others who are coming in. Praise God. Now, if you go back to Acts 2 and 41, uh, just prior to the verse uh, where we we're, that we're dealing with in this study starter, uh, the newly filled believers had left the upper room and they were uh, out in Jerusalem. They went into the streets of Jerusalem and when they, be, when they went out there in a few hours, 3,000 more became believers uh, and were baptized in Jesus' name. Now, that's a remarkable thing to happen very shortly afterwards. Then if you go down to Acts 4, uh, verse 4, uh, and this was a few weeks later, uh, and, and even to the dismay of the religious leaders at that time, uh, another 5,000 people were saved. And so that really blew people away. Uh, what we read throughout the book of Acts is an account of believers navigating their way through this new life in Christ Jesus. Now, the book of Acts touches on many of the physical, emotional, and even spiritual obstacles that they faced, but also that they overcame. Uh, to be clear, uh, what they did was remarkable. When you really think about it, it was remarkable when you consider they had no more than bits and pieces of the Old Testament and the leadership of apostolic ministers and of course, the Holy Spirit to rely upon. That's what they had, you know. Now, I want to say that because right now, many of you are watching on your smartphone. You may be watching on your computer and you may have Bibles in your computer. You may have the entire scripture. You may have, you have access to so much information on the internet. You have a lot of different things. And it, was, it would mean to me that we should be able to walk in the same authority and power that they did in the first century because we have so much at our disposal. Today, we not only have the Holy Spirit, but we also have further insights as to how they overcame in the midst of these physical, emotional, and spiritual attacks that they encountered. Uh, we have the direct guidance of the Holy Spirit. We have that. We know we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, if anything needs to be taught in greater uh, detail is that you can be directed in all things by the Spirit of God. I'm going to say that again. You can be directed by the Spirit of God in all things. The religious mindset has too often uh, limited works, the workings of the Holy Spirit to emotional outbursts and hu the humanistic concept of something told me to do such and such. I mean, that's what we've reduced the Holy Spirit to. We need to understand the workings of the Holy Spirit in our day-to-day -day lives, moment by moment. Uh, that should be a common occurrence in our lives. Uh, we have the written account of how the believers walk in the Spirit as a lifestyle uh, we have the letters of Paul to various assemblies uh, throughout the regions that uh, brought clarity to the full expression of the Holy Spirit in many situations. Uh, and we see that walking in the Spirit was not rocket science, but rather it was a moment-by-moment -moment direction uh, of, uh, from God that we simply walk day by day and we just simply obey what the Spirit of God is telling us to do at any given moment. Praise God. In Romans 8, uh, verses 26 and 27, we see why Paul wrote, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we ought to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. 
Uh, and he that searches uh, the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You So in other words, we have the Holy Spirit who's going to make intercession for us, who's there for us, who's leading and guiding us into all truth. And we can go into all of that. But I want to get you to a specific place this morning. Uh, one thing must be kept in our heart at all times is that the Holy Spirit never directs us outside of the will of God. Uh, that is why searching the scriptures daily with other believers is so critical to your maturity. I really firmly believe that. That's that Acts 242 model that we're going to spend time into. They continue daily in uh, fellowship, breaking of bread and fellowship, and the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread and fellowship, and in prayers. Uh, and the word of God will reveal the will of God. Uh, we discover uh, that in this study, the enemy's primary attack is to pervert the word of God, and but he never disputes it. I, I pick that up as I begin to look at scripture. The enemy of God primarily tries to de pervert the word of God rather than to dispute it. Now, just take a moment to consider that. Just let that sink in for a moment. Any attempt to pervert the word of God is actually an acknowledgement that the word of God is true, that it is valid, that it is powerful. And, and, and so if you want to pervert it, what you're trying to do is to try and take away what it really is, it's trying to hide its truth, trying to diminish its power and take away its validity. That's what perversion is all about. So in other words, you don't pervert something that is already perverted. No, you pervert something that is good and powerful. So you want, you're trying to change it. Uh, just let that uh, marinate in your spirit sometime today. Amen. Jesus said that deception would be the primary tactic used to defeat believers. Matthew 24 and 24 says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and show great signs and wonders, insomuch if it were possible. I love it the way it puts that in the King James. If it were possible. I know other translations have it uh, says, if possible. But I love it, and the King James says, if it were possible, that it would deceive the very elect, if it were possible. The if it were possible uh, suggests that the chosen of God really can't be deceived. It is not possible to deceive them because they are aware of the tactics of the enemy. To be clear, you and I are the elect. We, You and I are the chosen of God. This is not some iconic person up here. You and I are the elect. Uh, you hear me say that church as we know it is in transition. You hear me say that quite a bit. Uh, there will be structural changes, and that's in how we gather. I believe that in all my heart. Uh, there will be doctrinal clarity, uh, and this is we'll understand more and more why we believe what we believe. We'll get that. Uh, there will be governing clarity. Uh, the roles of leadership will shift from the, its hierarchical stance. Uh, so a lot of these things are going to happen in this time of transition. What is critical, what is critical for us to understand is that during a transition, the enemy seeks points of entry to deceive believers. Is while you're in the flux of being uh, trans uh, transitioning, that's when the enemy will try and sneak something in to throw you off. And that's why it is important that we study these enemy's tactics. We don't glorify the enemy, but we need to be wise as to what he's doing. The Bible says we're not ignorant. Uh, of his devices. So before we can study Acts 2.42 uh, about the Apostles' Doctrine, uh, fellowship, breaking of bread, and, and, and prayers, before we study that, we need to understand uh, that we need to see quickly uh, and discern quickly when the enemy tries to uh, throw something in that will throw us off guard. Now, in our previous session, we began outlining six components uh, and factors that the enemy uses to deceive. And again, the purpose of deception is to pervert the truth in order to suppress the power and ultimately defeat uh, the believer. Uh, throughout the letters that Paul and Peter wrote, uh, they exposed demonic traps the enemy would use to try and thwart uh, obedience to the Lord. And the six areas that we're going to discuss are beguiling, bewitching, sorcery, feigned words, blindness, and false Christ. Now, beginning with beguiling, we, we've already dealt with that. That is the use of charm to try and get somebody in. Uh, the, serpent, the, the serpent beguiled Eve. 
Uh, and in other words, you'd be so much better if you just eat of the tree. You know, have you driven a Ford lately? You know what I mean? That kind of a concept. You try and charm them and you draw them in by really making them feel good about doing something bad, you know? So that's charming them. Then there is bewitching. Uh, that's to cause amazement. Uh, uh, and using for self-promotion. Amen. Uh, and, and, and you promote yourself as some great one, like Simon the Sorcerer. He bewitched them. Uh, now, some may not like, like what I'm about to share right now, but let's deal with it just so we can bring some things into where we are. Some of our conferences that we promote are right on the edge of bewitching. Now, I want you to hear me carefully. I'm not saying that these are bad people. I'm not saying that they are, they have intention, but we have to be very careful. You know that you hear this for only $199 plus the cost of your traveling rooms. This will be the greatest, most anointed conference with the most anointed and appointed speakers that you'll ever hear in all your life. And now I say this uh, because I too have sponsored conferences and I'm asking myself, what has been the impact? Did the two or three day inter international meeting that I had, okay, listen to me, uh, did I impart workable truth to those in attendance uh, that can imp impact them for uh, li the entire life and give them something to go back and change their regions? Or, or did it, was it just something that I promoted that we found a way to do something that and it made it a little profitable for us to do this? We, we must be very careful and prevalent to discern our motives. Now, am I saying we shouldn't have gatherings and large things like this? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that, but I do say we need to really check our motives. Praise God. That's your free part. Let me go on. Amen. Now, in our last session, we were dealing with the issue of sorcery. Closely linked to uh, bewitching is sorcery, and that's the use of magic, uh, doing one thing and making it appear as another. Uh, a look into Simon and Bar-Jesus, uh, they were both called sorcerers. And there were several things that revealed their their methods, what uh, sorcery does. And I want to just give you a quick look, look, look at them. Uh, they promote themselves as being great. That's a sign of sorcery. Uh, it is closely intertwined with the prophetic. We need to take a look at that. It often attaches itself to legitimate authority. In other words, they, they create validation by association. Um, it uh, turns those seeking the word of God away from the truth. Now, and that's a real tricky one. You're going to see that later on. Uh, they turn themselves, because they'll use the word of God to turn people away from the word of God. Now, now follow me. Uh, they, they, they turn people, those seeking the word of God, they'll turn them away from the truth. And they pervert the word of God through physical and verbal magic and trickery. That's what they end up doing. This leads us to this next enemy uh, of, our, of our faith, the thing that the enemy will use to try and deceive us, and that is feigned words. And I want to spell that so you'll get that right. Feigned, F-E-I-G-N-E-I-D, words. Feigned, F-E-I-G-N-E-D, feigned words. I want you to get that. And what are feigned words? They're fictitious words, twisting and molding to create a narrative. This is what uh, feigned words is all about. How one articulates does not mean that they are accurate. Uh, let's call it magic of the mouth. Um, there was a man in the Old Testament named Ahipothel. He, uh, the Bible said he spoke as of the oracles of God. When you heard him, he sounded so eloquent. He sounded good. And the thing is that he was the one who counseled uh, David's son as, a, as to how to overthrow him. In other words, he sounded good, and he could sound good, and he was. But yet, his words were used against uh, the man of God in that time. So you have to be careful listening to people who are extremely articulate. This is not saying that you should not talk with some sense just because you want to talk in any kind of way. Don't mean no, no. You need to really be able to understand and discern what is being said. Uh, in Second Peter chapter two, verses one, two, and three, we read this. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Note the process. They, 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 they bring these things in. They begin to set these things in. Uh, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. 
Now, I want to share this again. Unjust prophecies and unexamined teachings are dangerous. That's why I encourage you to study. Amen. If you, you know, you have a right to judge any prophetic word given to you. You need to examine teachings to see if they line up with the whole counsel of scripture, not just a, a little piece that's brought out here and there just to get a point across, but you need to make sure they follow the entire narrative of the word of God. Let's go on. Second Peter 2 and 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Get this. And through covetousness, get this, through covetousness, the desire for personal gain, for that reason, shall they with feigned words, that's verbally twisting and pervert the truth, make merchandise of you. In other words, they're going to use you for their personal gain. They'll make merchandise of you because uh, you become a product, if you will, to help them become everything they want to be. The Bible says, whose judgment now is of, uh, of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. With feign, within feign words is the perversion of truth for personal gain. That is the one thing you need to get. Truth twisted is dangerous. You need to learn to discern. Truth twisted is dangerous. Learn to discern. Get with others. Avoid private interpretations. Uh, listen. In our journey over the years, my wife and I have had the opportunity to meet with individuals uh, who you've probably seen on national television. And I'm not saying that as a point of bragging, but, you know, we've just been blessed and, and had the occasion to meet with some of these people. I learned some things troubling about the inner workings of some of these national ministries. That's the point I want to get to. One thing is that certain teachers are recruited for fundraising purposes. Uh, that really just caught my attention. They have a skill to take just about any scripture and make it an appeal for you to give money. I mean, you name the scripture, they could take the words Jesus wept, and before it's over, uh, they will find a way for you to be giving your money over Jesus weeping. I mean, it's just the way that they are. Scripture is used totally out of context, uh, but often the notoriety of the speaker, because they have been promoted as some great one, uh, gives the impression that what they're saying is valid. Uh, and there's often a blatant use of both sorcery and feigned words. So you need to get this. Uh, have you ever noticed... Oh, Jesus, shall I go? Yeah, I'm going to go here. Have you ever noticed that uh, supposedly when they say, I sense the spirits saying that 25 people should give $1,000, uh, that they don't stop when the 26th person comes up? Let that sink in for a moment. Why is it that the benefits of giving is usually attached to material gain. It's usually not attached to the heart, but always attached to some spiritual gain. How many times have you gone to a big conference that begins with a great show of prophetic words that seem to be right on the button and healing, and uh, you see all this healing, and then immediately afterwards, giving is attached to it, and statements like, oh, while the Spirit is here, uh, to anoint your giving, you see the Spirit of God is moving, so you need to give right now while the Spirit is high, while it's really ripe for you to give, so God can do something with your giving. Show me that combination in Scripture, and I'll eat the page. You see, this is when we start talking about feigned words and all of these things being used to twist people into doing things uh, just for the, the benefit of the ones who are saying it. Uh, I use giving as the most uh, because that's the most often place that feigned words are used. Feigned words are used to promote people, to give the impression that they're more than what they are. Titles have become a subtle form of feigned words. Now, listen, I just I, we, we can spend another whole teaching on titles alone, but they have been used to as a subtle form of feigned words because they promote an individual. Uh, let's, let's go on. In John 12 and 32, Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. This is what Jesus said. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Anytime we lift up anyone or anything rather than Jesus to draw people to ourselves, to draw people to our programs, to draw people to our ministries, we become dangerously close to using feigned words to accomplish it. So we need to be very careful on how we approach uh, the word of God. We, we can start doing things 
to manipulate people. We start doing things to cause people to, to, to respond a certain way. And as a result, we end up wounding people. Uh, these things that we need to understand from the very beginning before we get together because you need to be mature in your walk in the Lord. And what I don't want to have happen is that the enemy can use beguiling, that he can use bewitching, he can use sorcery, he can use feigned words, and as we will get into the next area, start using blindness. Now, that's a, that's another big one. Our next session, we're going to deal with the uh, how the enemy uses blindness to deceive us and understanding what blindness is all about. Uh, when you get that, you will keep just like, just like Paul said, Lord, open my eyes that I can see. Open my ears that I can hear in the name of Jesus God. We want to be uh, to see and discern and understand what the Spirit is doing at all times, not just here and there, but at all times. Now, listen, let me say this. I'm not trying to stir up you to become suspicious of everybody because a lot of people with good hearts don't realize that they've slipped into some of these areas. So I'm not trying to make you suspicious that you run around suspecting and pointing the finger at everybody. Uh-huh, they're using feigned words. Uh-huh, they're a sorcerer. No, I'm not telling you to do that. I am telling you to learn to discern by the word of God. And then we will have to show you then once you discern how something is done, how do you respond when you find somebody who is a good person uh, just by uh, tradition using feigned words, just by tradition uh, uh, doing something that is off kilter, but yet they don't realize it. Oh my God, this is, this is going to get fun. This is going to get great. We're going to study it. Praise God. Thank you for tagging your friends. Thank you for uh, sharing this on your timeline. Thank you for praying for us. That's the biggest thing right there. I just bless you for it. God is doing what he's going to do. Amen. And he's doing a great thing in you. I believe Jesus is still building today with believers just like you because of Caesarea Philippi. He said he would build his ecclesia and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. You are powerful in the name of Jesus. Lift up your hands and say, Lord, I thank you and I bless you for all you're doing in my life in Jesus' name. Well, thank you for being with us today and always remember that God is still on the throne. The devil is defeated and Jesus is Lord. You be blessed. Thank you for watching this study starter. If you enjoyed this teaching, please give us a thumbs up below. By doing so, you can help us reach many more people. Also, if you haven't already done so, please click the subscribe button so you won't miss any future study starters. There are many more segments to come. Again, thank you for watching and we hope to see you again soon.